Hello and welcome to Midwest Game Fest Online 2022. My name is Beth and I'm with the Role Players Guild of Kansas City. I am here today with Aaron Dykstra, the Shadowrun Missions developer. Hello. Uh, Jeff Stevens from Jeff Stevens Games. Hello everyone. And John Hook from Modern Mythos. Hi, good afternoon. And the four of us today are going to be talking about uh, writing to running. So what it sort of takes to both uh, write a module and then how that process goes to the table. Before we go too far into it, though, I do want to let you know that we are taking questions from the chat. So if anybody has any questions, make sure to post them and I will do my best to uh, get those questions answered for you guys. And now, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and start with Jeff. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I am Jeff Stevens. I started, so I, I was playing back in the 80s and 90s. D&D uh, &D Champions, Shadowrun, I played a little Cthulhu, Twilight 2000, just all kinds of all different RPGs. And I stopped, took a long hiatus, got back in the game about five years ago. Found that I loved writing and DMing and found the Dungeon Master Guild and started publishing my products there. And that's where I am today. I've started my own small company based on my success there and hope to continue creating cool content, not only just for 5e, but for other systems, should I happen to have the time to learn the rules. Absolutely. Uh, what about you, Aaron? Hi, I'm Aaron Dykstra. I'm the Shadowrun Missions Developer, which is the online living camp, or not online, uh, it, online and offline living campaign. Uh, so it's a, a set of missions that we produce every year for players and GMs to consume. I've been running uh, the missions uh, part of the organization for about a year now. Um, and prior to that, I was one of the writers, proofers, and editors for content for a few years on that. And uh, yeah, I just it's it's super fun to create content for players and GMs to to run on their home tables or at a convention, and that's really what has drawn me uh, into doing more and more each year. And finally, but definitely not least, John. Hi, I'm John Hook. I started getting into role playing in uh, Christmas of 1978 when I got my. Holmes basic version of uh, D and D that box set. What a and Christmas gift! What a Christmas gift! Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, and yeah. I have played a just a, a metric ton of uh, different uh, role playing games. But I, I, you know, my bread and butter, my my real wheelhouse is with Call of Cthulhu, and I've played Call of Cthulhu from its very first uh, uh, version, and uh, and now in the from the fifth edition to the current seventh edition, I have done some contribution writing, uh, both as a uh, independent uh, writer, and I've also done some work um, yeah. for Chaosium itself. Wow, that's a lot of varied experiences from each of you guys. So this is going to be really great. 
I kind of want to first talk about uh, inspiration, right? Before you even start putting pen to paper, um, like anybody still uses paper nowadays. Uh, <laughs> but what inspiration does each of you sort of pull from for the different systems that you work for? Uh, John, let's go ahead and start with you. I, I'm an avid reader. I, I love to read, you know, old 60s, 70s, 80s sci-fi horror fantasy novels. Um, and I might come across uh, a scene or a type of character or a setting that um, that'll inspire me. And I'll go, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder if there's something else that I could do with that. You know, so I'm not completely uh, trying to take that material and, and put it into a game but you know make it different somehow or, or blend a couple of different things together so yeah i do a lot of reading watching tv and things like that and i pull from that for my inspiration uh excellent jeff what about you um also reading uh, I'll, uh i get a lot of inspiration from uh, imagery so if i see a piece of artwork or uh, something interesting in the news or something I'll, I'll, that'll really spark an idea in me and I might try to put that down on paper. Also, if I just happen to think of a cool title for an adventure, um, just, you know, just, hey, that sounds really cool and you know, kind of build off of that. Uh, there's just, and music also. Um, like I had mentioned in an earlier podcast, I based my whole home fifth edition campaign on Metallica title song titles um, and just kind of let that build off of every song title and the master of puppets was the bad guy you know of course it was uh but uh but yeah that, those kinds of things really inspire me excellent and uh aaron it, it's it's definitely the same as everybody else uh music books uh movies uh one of my favorite tricks to use is i go read the plot summary on the back of the dvd case and uh, I'll pick one line, and that will be the start of a, a scenario. That's cool. Um, an example of that was I, I created a scenario uh, because I read the back of the Willow Box, and uh, it was <laughs> you know uh, this this orphan baby uh, that was a foundling, and I was like, okay, well we're going to use that as a core of a mission, and we're going to build off of that. Pretty cool. I, I really love that. We have a question from chat. This one's from uh, Stila Bauer. Do you think that knowing multiple uh, tabletop RPGs is the best way uh, to finding a writing style, or is it better to focus in on one or two games? Uh, and we'll hit that to uh, Jeff first. I think you need to start writing based on what your favorite game is. Uh, I think that's where your passion's really going to lie. And you, you've already have a idea of how the rules work, of how the rules write. The mechanics, mechanical writing is one of the toughest there is. And you want to try and make it match the original core rules as close as possible. Um, so that's really where I think you need to start if you're going to start writing is, is the game that you love the most. John? Yeah, I agree. When you have a experience with one particular game, you've you've got the passion for that game, and each publisher has their own uh, style and language on how they format their adventures, how they format their core rules, and um, publishers want to see that. They want to if you're trying to write and hopefully be uh, discovered or you know at least be able to send something to someone you admire and then they like it, they are more apt to uh, like it if it's in a style that they recognize. Uh, so I think it would, it would be important to just kind of focus on one and try and build your skills up and master that style first before you try and branch out to others. Excellent. Aaron? I think it's sort of twofold. Um, there's there's matching style, which uh, I definitely see a lot more when when contributing to rule books or plot books or basically campaign setting books. Um, when when building sort of a scenario that you want uh, to create, I think knowing the the style that the scenario uses, whether it's a fiasco, a heist, 
um, something that's a little bit more horror. There's there's sort of elements of the writing that that style needs that is one of the best things. So if you play a lot of that style, you're naturally going to have an easier time writing in that style. And so that's that's one thing I would recommend. Yeah, but I also think that if you're involved in multiple RPGs, that you're going to draw possibly some um, scenarios or some aspect of the other RPG into your current writing, which isn't bad. You know, you're, you may bring bring in something new that hasn't been done yet, which drawing from other RPGs and systems is great if you can convert it to the current system and not break licensing rules. Yeah, I would imagine that that's uh, kind of the the difficulty is uh, licensing licensing rules, uh, which actually leads me to a question: What is the biggest disadvantage when you're dealing with a specific license? Um, and uh, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and give that to you since you you mentioned it. Okay, yeah. So I publish mostly on the DMs Guild, which allows me to use Watsi's intellectual property. The lithids, mind flares, beholders, that type of thing. Uh, for that, I, I lose a certain percentage of my sales to, for, to cover the license, which I can do the same thing if I publish on DriveThru RPG or Amazon or somewhere else. I can't use specific IP from, from Watsi. It's, it's against the rules. So it, where I publish depends on what I'm writing and what, what, what creatures and, and mechanics within D&D I'm able to use. Um, and so those those kind of rules you kind of have to watch. You have to make sure that you're aware of those before you just start writing and publishing. I've seen some Kickstarters who are, you know, doing things in the Underdark. Well, that's a that's a IP that's for Watsi that you cannot use. And there's certain other things that people are doing um, on Kickstarter that might be taken down because they're they're breaking the licensing rules that are in the OGL and SRD and um, just things you really need to be aware of before you actually start publishing and try to make money off your product or your writing. Uh, kicking this over to John, how does that kind of affect what you do uh, since uh, Mythos is uh, a little more in the public domain, isn't it? Correct. Uh, Lovecraft's creations are in the public domain, uh, but there is still a, a lot a lot of the creatures that we think of as Cthulhu Mythos creatures that were not created by Lovecraft. They were created by some of the other writers that are kind of participating in that Lovecraft circle of writing. And to this day, some of those uh, elements, those creatures or planets or, you know, whatnot, maybe it could be an artifact, um, they are still owned by an estate or some sort, you know, for that writer. So, um, uh, being aware of what is in bounds and what is out of bounds is uh, critical uh, for even for the Cthulhu mythos uh, because you need to make sure that you're not going to be treading into waters where somebody else actually owns that monster. Um, and, you know, Ch Chaosium is really pretty uh, open in letting uh, fans know what is in bounds, what's out of bounds. Um, and you just have to make sure that you're adhering to it. The great thing with uh, the Mythos uh, in particular is that it's endless and, and, you know, authors can just make something up and just add to that fabric, you know, add to that tapestry. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, so I want to sort of pass this over to Aaron, but with a little bit of twist, because I know uh, Shadowrun does a lot of parry, uh, not parrying, um, I can't think of the word that I'm uh, trying to say right now, but um, really plays off of tropes and stuff like that. So how does that deal with intellectual property? I think one of the, the bigger elements we run into is because it's modern. So we'll like, can you use Disney as a company? which is always fraught with peril right like oh yes. uh, and and so the the tropes themselves i mean there's there's a reason they're tropes right like they're uh they're commonly used and abused and they they're good story elements but you have to do it in a unique and interesting way to to utilize them the uh so you're, you're usually okay doing that and having no problems. The the problem with writing uh, for a generic cyberpunk, uh, because for writing for Catalyst, like you have to be one of their freelancers or basically paid to do it. 
Uh, they use a slightly different model than what WotC has started to do with, with the DM guild. Uh, it means that you can't use the company names that are used within the setting if you're writing a generic cyberpunk. Um, if you try to blend in magic, you can't use any of the magic spell names unless they're ones that are right. pretty wide open uh, that would appear in other settings. So it's it's a little bit more tricky. Um, well, and I think um, there was a an IP that is no longer owned, right? So like you can't reference anything from the Earth Dawn IP uh, into well, Shadowrun anymore. So we kind of can. And we kind of can't. Um, so if it's something that's been referenced in the prior to the split day, um, so there has been things that crossed over uh, prior to when FASA sold the rights into two separate uh, spaces. Like those things are still in canon and you can still use them and still write them. But everything that happened since, that's where it gets a little bit more dangerous in pulling those things over, even if you really love some of those elements. Gotcha. Uh, so Jeff, you had mentioned, uh, SRD and, uh, GL and actually shadow tool mentioned in the chat. Can you explain what, uh, the SRD and the OGL are to those who may not be familiar? Yeah. The SRD is a system reference document. Basically it is the free basic rules that Watsi provides to anyone. You can get it on their website. Um, and the o OGL is the open gaming license telling you what you can and can't use when you're publishing third party products. And the OGL lists um, like the intellectual property that you cannot mention, like Dungeons and Dragons or D&D, &D, or I think it may also say D20, uh, Elithids, Mind Flayers, Beholders, uh, Displacer Beasts, several other um, intellectual properties that they don't want other people to write on because, probably because there's a specific storyline or lore to those creatures that they don't want other people to expand on um, and change canon on. Uh, right. But yeah, the, so, the so system reference specific to that setting, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, like, yeah, all kinds of different things that they list in there that you cannot touch. Um, but the SRD also lists monsters and creatures that you can reference. Uh, so they've got in the basic rules, it's, it, uh, in that PDF that they provide is basically like a, a, the reference guide for a writer, a third party company saying that these are the things that you can use. Um, if they're not in here, you can't use them. So a lot of things in the player's handbook, a lot of the classes, uh, a lot of the subclasses, feats and that type of thing are not referenced in the SRD. And so you can't use those. Gotcha. So I know Aaron got to touch on tropes just a little bit, but, uh, I know that's kind of something that can be very big in a lot of uh, Kafal Who and, and other writings like that. Uh, John, do you want to talk about a little bit about tropes within uh, your writing as well? Yeah, uh, the kind of tropes that, uh, that I usually end up working with are yeah. going to be types of horror. Um, and usually things like body horror and, uh, and pulling that in. Um, tropes with uh, how certain insanities might get handled um, tropes with uh, haunted houses right you know just some of the different things that you might pull in and place into a haunted house um, it's it's interesting uh, to kind of work with uh, horror tropes I think because horror is something that uh, is uni I think is universal for everyone everyone knows what the feeling of fear is like and and people just you know process it differently so it's it's exciting fear is exciting you know and it's uh it's neat to kind of touch on to that and and tropes can help uh bridge that gap between trying to describe event in the game and then having your players feel that event uh because if you if you start relating it to a trope that's something that that unconsciously they're going to reach back and, and pull the reference card for that and go, oh yeah, I know what that is. Uh, so tropes can be handy. So what are ways that each of you guys sort of try to subvert these known tropes uh, in your writing or do you just embrace them wholeheartedly? Uh, 
Jeff, you go ahead and first. <laughs> I'm trying to think. It's so hard to get away from tropes. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. just because they're so easily easy to, to use. Um, but I think the idea is to start with the trope and then put a spin on it. Um, you know, in, in the game I'm running tomorrow, the night of the rise, you know, it's it's a simple trope. Go defeat bandit because they've got a toll and they're charging the, the um, village to um, go back and forth. Go get rid of the bandit. Well, there's a lot of different ways that could ha that could happen within the adventure itself, and so that's, I think, just starting with the basic trope and then making s some changes or nuance, or you know, or just kind of adding flavor to make it a little bit different than the standard trope. What about you, Aaron? I know Shadowrun tends to uh, take those tropes and just. Uh, love them. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to love them. Um, I, I look at tropes as a tool, right? Like it helps to find a pattern that is just really useful and people recognize. And, and when you have a player recognize it, they, they feel smarter. Um, it, it's really nice. Um, so uh, I think a, a useful way to do it is to combine tropes. And so to take two tropes that look like they don't really mesh very well to present a player choice. So they can either go down the route of, uh, you know, dealing with the poison well, which is, you know, a pretty common one, or go save the the farmer uh, who's currently being held hostage, hostage nearby. And so you have sort of this decision point and you, you can allow the players that sort of freedom to go back and try the other, but it's way harder based on the selection and choices they've made. Excellent. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to add to that? No, I mean, I, I do like being able to use a trope to present an option and um, players, this is what really challenges players, I think, is because they might be expecting, because it is a trope, that uh, if they make that certain choice and they follow through with the options that are being presented by that trope, that they can expect a certain outcome and having different outcomes uh, from those choices, I think, makes it exciting you know so if you know they think saving uh the princess um is you know going to win and allow them to to earn the gold and stuff then when you turn that trope on its head and and uh you know the princess was kidnapped because she's actually trying to start a war you know and you just freed her so now she can start that war right i mean you kind of turn that on its head and, and that's interesting for the players to experience excellent so switching topics just a little bit and i'm i'm gonna pass this one to aaron first uh what is your approach to including uh story information or setting information from previous modules into a new module that you might be writing? Uh, so I, I have a, a little bit probably different situation, which is I've got a set of authors that are are contributing to Shadowrun missions, and, and I'm trying to make sure there's a story that's woven through them, but that they're all individually playable in different orders, uh, because we never know uh, what order a player will ever encounter these, even though they're numbered, but I it's for conventions, right? Uh, so a lot of it is is rule number one is be blunt um if you're at a convention scenario if you're really really like gentle with the story that branches across they'll never catch it um and so you have to be a lot more blunt than you want to if you're writing a novel or if you're trying to produce uh, like a, co a continuous set of fiction uh the the other is uh put it everywhere like uh, if they're doing legwork and they talk to a contact, make sure that there's something in there that references back to a previous mission or maybe sets uh, foreshadowing for a future one. Uh, maybe they've encountered a piece of paper or they find a file on a server somewhere that they're able to see like, hey, there's a reference here. And so we, a couple a couple years ago, for which uh, 2020 was a mess, but uh, we did a, a four pack of missions, uh, which told this story of this evil corporation that was trying to kill off a, a subset of the population. And we just sort of hinted at it all through the entire thing until you get to the final scenario where all of those hints get pulled together. Uh, and that 
I definitely had players come up and, and, and basically say like, oh my gosh, I finally figured it out at, at mission three of four. Like I saw the threads starting to come together and that, that always feels really good. You know, and threading them together like that is also free advertising for your other adventures. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a way to promote, okay, well, you're in this adventure. Well, they made reference to this. What is that? Let's go find out what that is. Oh, there's another adventure. So yeah, it's that's always a great thing to do. John, what about you? You know, in the realm of, of Call of Cthulhu, there aren't that many adventures that are standalone that reference each other. But I have had uh, for myself a couple instances where I've written something to be... Uh, a sequel to something that's already been published or to be an optional side quest kind of thing that can be inserted into a standing campaign. Um, because for Chaosium, most of the time, if they're going to uh, write a campaign, it's, it's written all together. And so you'll have all of the adventures for the campaign in a single published you know, source instead of, you know, uh, several different adventures, uh, uh, individually done. But, uh, you know, I did one, um, you know, called, uh, uh, of wrath and blood, which was a sequel to the haunting. And the haunting is a classic introductory adventure. It's my favorite intro introductory adventure for call of Cthulhu. It's been uh, included in every iteration of uh, of the of the game and i just thought it would be interesting because it had so many interesting uh elements into it to go okay you've defeated this version of the big bad what if you what if it didn't actually die what if you didn't actually defeat it and now it continued on and here's how it could have continued on and so then i did this uh, sequel that was a lot of fun so but we don't see a lot of that in call of cthulhu yeah, and that, that's fair. Uh, we have another question uh, from chat. Steela Bauer asks, what kind of writing programs or editing programs do each of you use? Is one better to prepare for selling a product on a guild uh, and another better for running the adventure live with players? Uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, start us off? Sure. I use Microsoft Word. That's my choice. Now, there's, other, there's a lot of other... Uh, like there's home brewery. Uh, there's some other scribus. I, I can't remember all the different um, programs that are out there to make it look more official. Well, you know, like all the official things. But um, I like to use Microsoft Word, and I can I can drop in the um, background coloring pages and the art. And these, you know, it's, it's taken me a while to figure out how to do that in Word, but I've, I've been able to create PDFs that are usable by by GMs and DMs. Um, but then when I've, I've got the extra money where a product does really well, I have a layout artist who will lay it out in InDesign and then create it so that I can actually uh, do print on demand, um, put it on Amazon, that, that type of thing. So I, really, I, I find Microsoft Word is my choice for initial writing. And then if somebody else can bring that into another system, that's great for me. Uh, as far as editing, I do a lot of self-editing, which isn't that great of an editing. <laughs> and I do have an editor that I work with, or, or a couple editors that I work with, who uh, polish my um, my my writing because, you know, I unfortunately did not pay a lot of attention when I was in uh, elementary and, uh, and junior in high school uh, because I didn't know I wanted to be a writer <laughs> at that time. So uh, you know, commas. Uh, colons and all that hyphens semicolons are sometimes get away from me so it's always nice to have somebody else read over your work and actually apply some grammar rules to it um, so that it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb when somebody else reads it and to be honest i think writers and editors are our own worst enemies because like if, an, if another writer or editor were to pick up my work and read it and they'll say oh well that's not right that's not that shouldn't be a comma that should be a semicolon you know that, that kind of thing whereas the average reader isn't going to care it's mm -hmm. it's basically as long as the information is there for them it, it's cool they're not they know a lot of times they know that this is you know like a hobby uh a project or a love a project of love um and so they don't mind so much the typos the editing mistakes but myself where i've where i've come to i want my products to look as polished as possible john what about you what uh, sort of 
writing and editing programs do you use? I, I am also of house word. Um, I just, <laughs> it's very easy to use. I'm very accustomed to it. Um, and so all of my manuscripts are written in word. Uh, when I do go and I'm uh, producing something to be published uh, as a PDF, uh, I always uh, find and, and reach out to a layout artist and and say, "Hey, I need some help with this," and uh, and so they'll, you know, help me and we'll we'll lay it out. And I don't know what what you know technology they're using to to lay all that out in. It just gets done, and I'm like this looks amazing and <laughs> and then all right we're gonna publish this now and uh it's just yeah it's great and if i'm writing uh if i'm doing work for hire you know for like say chiasium um i just write in word i just write in word and i follow a house format that i need to uh, follow as far as you know uh laying out bullets or laying out uh you know call out boxes you know sidebars you know you know, I just I lay everything out and and use the uh, formatting that they request, and I send them I send them my Word doc, and and then eventually it gets uh, published, yeah, uh, beautifully. And I'm like, wow, that's that's magic. I like it. You know, it's that, that's a good point that you make because when I send my document off, I know that they're using InDesign to do my layout, and I open up InDesign and it's like looking at an alien spacecraft um, <laughs> dashboard, you know, I don't know what does what and if I push something, I'm like, I gotta screw something up. So it's just like any other thing. I don't have the time to learn that program right now because I'm not a full-time creator. I still have a day job when I'm, when I'm not working my day job, I like to come home and project manage with my other projects or write, you know, and, uh, or art or art or cartography. So yeah, uh, I just don't have the time to learn those other programs. And so a laid out artist is a pretty good thing to have. They're good people. Mm -hmm. And so are editors. Is Aaron frozen? I think, yeah, I do think Aaron might be frozen. I think he's just staring intently into the podcast. He's mesmerized. You know, fair. <laughs> Uh, so while we wait for uh, Aaron to join us again or, or um, figure out what's going on there, uh, you guys kind of mentioned, as, as we're talking about layout, uh, part of that is going to be maps and art. Uh, and I really kind of want to ask you guys, how do you, what are your approaches to either creating art, creating maps, or even customizing or, or uh, commissioning those so commissioning art commissioning maps uh and we'll start with uh john please uh yeah i am a uh booger artist i just you know i i do stick figures and sometimes that is good enough uh you can scratch <laughs> out a little something and go that works uh, but there are so many talented people in this hobby and, uh, and with the aid of social media, it is easy to have conversations and reach out and talk to people and do these commissions. Um, you know, there are, uh, fans who want to, you know, donate their their time and 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 skills uh there there are those who are you know uh just looking to share in any kind of uh sales that might be made uh with your with your product if you are selling the product versus just making it for fun and giving it away um and then there are those who are true you know professionals i mean they this is what they do for bread and butter and uh you know if you want and clearly these artists are you know a tier um you know if if that's the, what you want your book to to have there's a cost for that you know and and so it just you have to decide is that a cost you're willing to pay and if not you know then just you know target your your product to uh, be at a certain tier and and have art for that tier um maps you know Good tar I, I think cartographers, um, 
I don't think cartographers get enough credit because they are true artists as well. Just like the layout artist is a true artist. Uh, you know, maps, I'm so hard with maps. I'm so diff it's so difficult for me to do maps. And I will, I will totally get brain locked on trying to do a map uh, if, if that ends up being important uh, for the scenario I'm doing. So it's hard for me to kind of get past that that barrier and go, I just need to draw the map, you know? So I love being able to interface and find uh, folks who do maps and, and just, you know, work with map makers as well. But maps can be fun. I, I, I'm doing a scenario right now and uh, there's lots of uh, floor plans and things like that, you know, like building layouts that you can find, you know, for free, you know, they're, they're public domain uh, floor plans, but I want another, I want another layer, right? I want a basement. So now I, I will, I will print off the ground floor and tracing paper and create a basement that goes with it and, and do my best as you know, as possible to try and, um, make it look, you know, in a similar style as, as everything else. But, uh, yeah, art and maps are, that's a real skill and those people are, should be committed. I, 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 I try to have as many artist friends as I can. <laughs> you got that right. Exactly. Because as soon as you need a piece of art, one of your friends, one of your artist friends is going to be like, well, I'm booked up for the next six months. Okay. Well, I got to find somebody else to do it. Um, but cartography, going back to the cartography, this is a map request I recently sent to one of my cartographers. Just kind of <laughs> this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this. Um, and uh is saga mckenzie who you can find on twitter is under saga illustrates i believe but um they do fantastic work uh and finding finding an artist or a cartographer who will take the time to read your project also to add in some of the details so if like this bookcase here or this fireplace here is really great and and a lot of times if i just provide a sketch and again like john i've got a stick figure i'm like stick figure stick figure dragon here you know there are you know, whatever flaming sword um they, they kind of get the point and if they read the the little snippet that i send them that's in the adventure it's it's fun to see their take on what i've written to see you know to actually see if that's what i want if they if they get the idea of what i'm trying to portray to them and if they don't then i adjust the writing to make it work um because trying to i think trying to Order art is like an art in itself to get it specific enough so that you get exactly what you want. A lot of times it may not be exactly what you want, but it's very close. And so you can make adjustments to that uh, because nobody can see the image that's in your head. Right. Yep. Agreed. I, you know, I, I did some work for a while uh, with uh, Goodman Games. They had a license to do uh, Call of Cthulhu Adventures. And so they were publishing them under a, banner called age of cthulhu which was a lot of fun i liked working with them and uh when it came time for the cover the publisher would ask me what do you think the cover should look like and so i would try and use language that you know photography language so foreground middle ground background you know worms eye view bird's eye view you know where's the camera positioned and then i try and describe what's in each of those layers and uh and the covers would you know i, I was always very pleased with the covers that came back out of of that process so that was always a lot of fun although they did do a cover one time where the scenario was set in the dreamlands and the heroes had guns you know rifles and shotguns and and you know pistols and i was like this is awesome guns don't exist in the dreamlands can you make those swords <laughs> and so they became crossbows and swords and so it was a it was a lot of fun you know getting back to the art and the maps now there's quite a few free maps that people can use especially for D, &D um type systems by dyson logos he's got a commercial use license on his system um great great work uh he's got um commercial map packs that i s would hopefully or, or suggest you support on drive through rpg um he asked for a small donation which is well, for the number of maps you get and the unlimited usage and it's it's a fantastic license that he offers uh it's a great thing to have um 
And also there's Incarnate, which is a software program that allows you to create your own maps based on you know, placing assets. Again, something I don't have time to learn how to do. Uh, that's right. why I do a lot of, a lot of commissioning. Um, but you know, if I slowed down and took the time, I could probably learn how to use Incarnate and build my own maps. Uh, art, there's a ton of um, inexpensive stock art that you can find on Drive Through RPG, and some I think of the, some of the community content programs that are available through Drive Through RPG may also have like art assets in those, like page backgrounds or um, other images that you can use within the product. So if you're looking for an inexpensive way to get into the hobby and actually make your product look good, that would be to use stock art from um, Drive Through RPG, I think. And I cannot stress enough that on that note, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brad McDevitt, has his clip art critters, and there's an <clears throat> entire line of them on Drive Through RPG, and they're super cheap. Um, Brad McDevitt's stuff is top notch. I love his work. Yeah, and again, you can you can draw so much inspiration from a good image too. Dean oh, Spencer's know. work, Matt Morrow's work, um, just they're so inspiring to me that, that just. I don't know. It's just so much fun to see when they release new products and new, new pieces of art. So, Aaron, we're talking about uh, commissioning art and maps, uh, and I'm really interested to hear how that kind of works for Shadowrun missions, because uh, your art is so detailed, especially your cover art. back so we uh Ooh, you are really robotic he is in the net catalyst yeah they have a, a set of artists as well well and so bandwidth uh, uh. all right let's try this again uh, um and so we put together an art portfolio and so that goes to catalyst and they okay produce amazing art Uh, uh, Tryman 159, we're actually going to try that uh, right now. Yeah. So, uh, it is kind of interesting. I know earlier we were talking about intellectual property art kind of goes into the same line with that there can always be you have to be a little careful with some of that stuff but uh like you guys said there's just so much inspiration that can be drawn from some of the the stuff that's out there uh shadow tool wanted to know uh you you've already mentioned a couple but what are some of the good uh map resources for modern day or 1920s style maps uh you know i do a lot of uh uh searching for um royalty free floor plans and and uh mm -hmm. you know deck plans floor plans that kind of thing so i always look for something that is um you know, normally uh, been drawn in the 1920s or something like that. So I know that it's, it's you know, it doesn't have any kind of copyright or anything on it. And I'll be able to lift uh, that kind of image. And uh, if I'm doing it myself, um, you know, I do a lot of tracing paper. You know, I might lay on it and draw this, but then add a different element to it and draw that too. And, I'm you know, I'll cobble stuff together. Or I'll send that out to a, a much more competent cartographer and and say uh, uh 
this is a source material uh, for style. You know, reference this for style, uh, but I need uh, it to have these elements because uh, I'm going to reference them in this scenario. And I'll list off the references and we'll work back and forth to uh, to come back with a map that, that will work. Uh, but with, you know, with when you're doing scenarios that are set in a in a uh, uh, believably real world ish type of setting it's pretty easy to uh, find the kinds of floor plans and things that you want uh, as opposed to, I, I think it would be much more difficult uh, if it weren't for resources like Dyson logos to find something that's more fantasy I would find that very difficult to do, you know, but that's not my wheelhouse, you know? Right. Yeah, that kind of uh, goes over to Jeff. How do you handle that kind of stuff? For, uh, what was the question again? So, so talking about how you find uh, map inspiration or where, where you find initially the question was modern, but in terms of a fantasy setting, mm -hmm. how do you find map inspiration? Uh, the first pro project I wrote for the DMs Guild got a lot of flack because it did the the layout didn't make sense of the floor plan. So this was when I hand drew, you know, putting oh this will be where the kitchen is, and they'll come over here. Oops, I forgot bathrooms. Oh, there's no door here. It doesn't make any sense how this layout works. So now I'm a, a lot like John. I'll go online and look for floor plans and kind of use that as a base idea. Um, make notes, references, send that to a cartographer. Jean Larbert um, has done some great work for me also in, in that area um, and really puts in the detail to make that house map look like it, it's a playable map. But yeah, definitely going online, trying to find something that you can that you can use as a reference. Doesn't have to match exactly, but you can use the, the layout as a reference for your writing is very helpful so aaron uh how does that work sort of with you where you sometimes have to deal with maps that are both in a physical space but also uh in a digital space sure uh so the maps that we're traditionally gonna pull for the physical meat space uh is gonna be stuff that you generally find on uh any sort of uh, architectural sites so it's really kind of interesting because we're able to pull and say like oh well we have a hospital we're just going to use a hospital layout and use their map which is super great um from a virtual like virtual has very little in the way of space right like it's mm -hmm. it's much more uh focused on uh indistinct distances and more of a feel so typically we're painting with pictures sort of these visual ele elements that you would see um, but you can travel infinitely fast uh in the digital realm so that that makes it a little bit more difficult to to set up sort of tactical gameplay mm -hmm. but yeah inspiration wise it's it's really just uh finding art and, and going from there and then in, in terms of uh handing off uh detailed notes to to Catalyst so that their set of artists can can try to render that in, in their best capabilities. Aaron uh, or, or John, do you ever come back where the artist or, the, or the, the cartographer comes back and says, you're missing something? You need this. It's not in your layout, like a bathroom or, you know, a kitchen or a bedroom or something like that. That would make more sense if it were in there. Uh, I don't recall, but I, I know I've had uh, you know, organic conversations with uh, uh, with my cartographers, and and maybe it'll be during the initial setup. They might be looking at a bullet list and go, "Hey, do you want to include anything else like this? Like, you know, any kind of foyer or any kind of you know back entrance or side entrance, or how many windows are in this building? That kind of thing, uh, because players are going to be looking for that. Something that uh, Aaron just mentioned that I wanted to touch on real quick is he mentioned the word tactical. And it's interesting because in uh, Call of Cthulhu, uh, most of the maps that we produce and use in uh, in that game are simply for spatial reference. Uh, this is over here. This is over there. 
and you can travel. But what we normally do not do is we are normally not focusing on, uh, it is likely that there'll be an, a, a, a combat event, which is what normally they're for, and have a tactical map for this area in order to run combat. Because for Call of Cthulhu, we're not normally running uh, tactical combat type of scenarios. Right. Most of our thing, most of our combat is more theater of the mind, uh, in which case, we're not that uh, concerned about where are the garbage cans, where are, you know right. the half covers and that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah, for uh, for artists coming back to uh, to to the writers with missing pieces, uh, most of the time, not so much. It's usually the reverse, and so we'll get back that initial view of the art, and then there's something off about it, like, hey, there's a table here, and there shouldn't be a table here because this is supposed to be like a wide open entry space, and so, and, and most of that's a failing on on the art on the author going like, I didn't provide enough information for you as the artist to to draw what was in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, that that tends to be a, a more common problem. Excellent. So we've talked a lot about uh, sort of drive through RPG and of course Shadow Mission, uh, Shadowrun missions. What uh, community content programs do you all participate? Are there any that you would particularly recommend? And to to go into this. Uh, Stila Bauer also had a question of is it better to list something that you've edited and play tested uh, for free or to put that 99 cent price tag on it? And I, I know that's kind of a two part question. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to toss this to you first. I'm going to go with the pricing first, real quick. Um, yeah. That's, that's a great question. It's. I don't know the correct answer to it. Um, what I do know that is if you put something up for free, you're not gonna make any money off of it at all. Whereas if you put a price on it, you may make some money off of it. The idea is what do you want to do with that product? If you're going to um, continue to make things on drive through RPG, if it's free and people are downloading it, you're creating a mailing list. So every time somebody da downloads something from drive through RPG, it adds their name to a consumer that's bought one of your products so that when you release a new product, you can email everyone that's bought one of your prior products. Now, some of those people can opt out. For instance, I may have 2,000 drive-through RPG followers or customers, but a thousand of them have opt out, opted out of emails. So when I send an email, it only goes to a thousand. And maybe 30% of that thousand opens my email that I send them. So, you know, it, the idea is to build as big a base as you can with that drive-through RPG email list. Um, assuming that only a, a handful are going to open it whenever you actually do send out an email. So if you do continue to produce, maybe it's not so bad to put a free product up there just to build your um, customer base. But then again, a lot of times people will only download free products. So if you put a price product up there, you may lose some customers because they don't want to invest in in something that you've created they just want free products so it's really i mean that's a great question and i don't have the right answer for it i'm just kind of giving um scenarios of how it would work if you have a great product and you put 99 cents on it and it gets a lot of um, attention through uh, podcasters somebody runs it on their channel and really loves it and they've got a lot of viewers you may end up making some money because they're going to link to that product and you're going to see some sales from it and you'll also retain those customers in your customer email list, but you may not get the number that you would if you had a free product listed. But yeah, it's there's the dynamics of how that works or just you never know basically what's going to work best for you. Fair. John, do you do you have any insight into that? Uh, yeah. Listing I, something as 99 cents versus free? Yeah, I prefer to put a price on everything um the my time and my energy and the energies of of those that i've pulled into my products because not a single product that i have on the uh drive through rpg miskatonic repository not a single one of those i created all on my own every one of those pieces has art every one of those pieces was laid out uh 
and and is in full color uh, and also there's uh, uh, versions for some of them that are in black and white to be more printer friendly um, but you know I have a team that helps me with all of them and um, I don't want to devalue their work by putting it out there for free so I, I do put a price on everything um, and it just kind of slides I kind of you know base pricing on uh how much energy went into it you know what's the page count what's the word count you know how much art is in it um uh, and that kind of thing how long did it take for this project to 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 you know go from conception to to you know being available and uh so i try and you know balance that and put a price on everything i do love the uh the the content creation program in uh, drive through RPG and that more and more uh, companies are kind of embracing that ability for fans to create product and put it out there in an official capacity. You know, you're, and it's a profit sharing with the, uh, uh, with that company. You know, if, uh, if I put something out on drive through RPG and it's, you know, $2, well, one of those dollars that gets sold uh, is split between Chaosium and drive through and then the other dollar goes to the team that helped create the product. And then, you know, since I'm normally the one who's kind of project managing that, I get to divvy up um, where the percentages are, you know, for, for that other dollar that comes in. So, you know, I might make 10 cents on something that uh, that's up there, but that's better than nothing. And, uh, and it helps, you know, build that community content and you know, get name recognition and that kind of thing mm -hmm. out there. It's just good practice. You to be a good writer, you just got to keep writing. Exactly. Cool. Yep. What kind of uh, community content programs uh, are available uh, for the stuff that you write, Aaron? Oh uh, well, we we don't have one at this at this time. Uh, so the Catalyst runs a little bit more traditional. Uh, in terms of publishing. So uh, I run as close to the community group as possible, but I have a li limited number of slots because Catalyst will pay the writers for the work that they've done. And so uh, typically in a given year, I make a call for 10 writers. Um, I publish that out on the Facebook page. I publish it off out through uh, Catalyst has its own suite of demo agents. And so they get sort of first pick uh, because they help out so much. Uh, it's usually writing a small section so we can take a look at the the ideas. We can take a look at uh, that they can follow some basic guidelines. Um, and then we pick pick the 10 that we like the best uh, for that year. And I really try to rotate that uh, to make sure that we give folks a chance to try writing and also reuse the ones that did exceptionally well. Because uh, anybody that uh, has basically does an awesome job uh, Jason Hardy, who's the, the line director for Shadowrun, made it real clear like he wants those names so that we can get them on the regular list of freelancers that will help out with the the full size books as opposed to the, the PDF only missions. Mm -hmm. Well, we are almost out of time, uh, but I do have just one one final question for you all. How do you go about balancing your personal life, your professional life, and then this sort of side gig of writing, right? Because I know many writers aren't able to do this for their as their full-time gig. So uh, how do you balance all these different aspects of your life? Um, Aaron, I'm going to kick that to you first. I... I don't balance it particularly well. Um, it's, it's probably the short of it. Um, I, I spend, you know, 40 to 40 to 50 to 60 hours on my day job. And then I probably put about 20 hours a week into uh, work for Catalyst to ensure that uh, content is being created and uh, things are getting play tested and things are getting edited because uh, I'll do the vast majority of the editing. Um, and then I still, want to play games right and i still uh, want to practice that yeah. art because gming is an art um and and so yeah that that's really all of my time about once a week i'll sit down with the kid and we'll we'll watch some movie or tv show or we'll play some games together 
Um, but that balancing act is, is really difficult. Uh, John, what about you? Well, I figure if my children are grow up and become, you know, disturbed individuals, I need to ignore them as much as I can now. Um, so I do the best that I can at that. No, uh, Obviously. yeah, you know, like Aaron, it's, it's, it's hard to carve out time. You know, you, you put in your, your regular work stuff and, uh, you know, uh, do everything you can with your family. And then there'll be times where I'll like, okay, daddy's going to go upstairs and podcast or daddy's going to go upstairs and, and, <laughs> uh, go play some games or something. And, and, you know, it's a language now so that now when, if I announce that the, the kids will just kind of roll their eyes and go, okay, whatever, you know, I, I do have one game that I play in on a weekly basis and we use, you know, costumes and a green screen and, oh, wow. and so my kids will open the door, you know, cause it'll be, you know, their bedtime and they'll look at me and they'll see me in full costume. They'll see the green screen looming behind me and they'll just shake their head and pull the door shut silently and walk <laughs> away. And I'm like, yes, I'm that dad. So mm -hmm. that's all right though. Uh, Jeff, what about you? It, it can be tough. It can be really tough. Like, you know, if you have a regular job and you're working 40 hours a week and then you've got a uh, family um, and you're also trying to write, produce, talk to artists, cartographers, uh, promotion, self-promotion. You know, if uh, I've got a newsletter that I send out every once in a while and, you know, writing that and providing links to things and that is time consuming. Posting on Twitter and, and Facebook and interacting with fans and consumers is time consuming. So it's, you know, there's a lot to it in the background. Uh, if you, all you want to do is write and post, you know, th that's great. Um, but if you are actually want to pr uh, promote your product and yourself and your image, th there's a lot of work to it. And it can be very difficult to balance. For sure, absolutely. I know how hard it is right now, just uh, content creation for, for me, content creation, work, and then, you know, other hobbies, something's got to give. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that ends up being my personal life, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with you there because, I mean, I enjoy this so much that I don't think I'd ever give it up. You know, if somebody yeah. say, you've got to stop something, I, I couldn't, I couldn't quit, you know? Uh, yeah. some aspect of it. I enjoy the project management. I enjoy the writing. I enjoy uh, doing Kickstarters and that type of thing and working with artists and everybody else. And it's just like, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I relate to that a lot. Uh, I guess I, I will ask one final question. This will be our last one uh, for sure this time. Uh, Rob Craft asks, uh, do any of you have websites uh, to promote yourself or your products? Uh, so how how can people find you on the internet? Uh, John, you go first. Uh, I have a podcast uh, that I do with Seth Skorkowski. Uh, he and I uh, talk about uh, game mastering, uh, player tips, and uh, usually how to apply that to the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And that is uh, Modern Mythos. Um, it's a Libsyn website, so I think it's, uh, uh, modern mythos. Yeah, there we go. It'll be in the show notes. <laughs> um, you know, and I use, uh, I use Facebook. I don't really have any other, uh, social media accounts cause I just don't understand them. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I talk a lot on my podcast and I'm on uh, discord and I'm on, uh, uh, Facebook. So that's how, that's how I can be found. Jeff, what about you? I have uh, my website, jeffstevensgames.com. It provides links to a lot of my products. Uh, I'm active on Twitter and Facebook. Twitter is at J-C-O-R-B-I-N-S-T-E-B-E-N-S. That's the worst Twitter handle anyone could ever provide for themselves, but I was <laughs> ignorant when I set that up, so I'm stuck with it. Um, uh, drive uh, drive through over Amazon.com. I'm sorry. Uh, DMs Guild, my work is there under Jeff C. Stevens. Uh, I have a podcast also uh, that I do monthly, so, somewhat monthly. Um, uh, Jeff Talks RPGs, available on uh, Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. 
and I think that's it. I have a newsletter also, which you can subscribe to if you uh, go to my website, jeffstevensgames.com, and there's a little link button there, and you can subscribe to it and get some links to freebies and notes about the industry and that type of thing. Excellent. Aaron? Uh, so the easiest way to, to get a hold of me is, and see what we're doing for Shadowrun is, is through the Shadowrun Missions Facebook page. Uh, I, I make sure that that's up to date with conventions that we're going to have our, our demo agents going to with some of the content that we've produced. Uh, in terms of like the writing I do, uh, I tend to be a little bit quiet on it. I'm pretty terrible at self-promotion. Um, I, I'm working on it. I'll get there eventually. Um, uh, but I do run a, uh, a weekly game on Twitch. Uh, my Twitch handle is Reverend Double, Reverend Double Zero, so zero zero. Uh, and we'll basically just we're playing a game. It's it's five of us or six of us that have been playing for about four or five years. And uh, really, it's it's about it's where I try out all my ideas before I write them because I, I I do a lot of YOLO or, or sorry improv. Uh, DMing, and then <laughs> if it works, I write it down later. Love that. Play testing is pretty important sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. didn't even get into play testing today. The it's time hard. just ran too quick. But uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, that will be it for us. Uh, you can join us here in about an hour uh, back here, right at this channel, where we get to talk about podcasting. So. I will see you all then, and all right. thank you all. Uh, th thank you to to you all for joining me, and this has just been a ton of fun. It has been. Thank, thank you. you. It was fun to be here. Absolutely. Bye, guys.